morning. I'd like to welcome everyone here this morning. Uh, you uh, are certainly, we are certainly thankful and grateful that each and every one of you are here and, and are present with us. We know we have a number of visitors with us this morning as well. We're thankful and grateful for your presence, and you are definitely our honored guest. And we, uh, I think Harry mentioned it last week, but we just seem to to be continuing to grow in number as we go throughout this time. People feeling more and more comfortable with with getting out, and that's good. And I know we also have a number across the uh, across the street over at the old building uh, with us this morning as well. And we're so thankful and grateful for your presence. So this morning, I like to uh, start off with the text we have in Acts chapter three. In Acts chapter three, we have an account. The day after Pentecost, we have the second gospel sermon, recorded gospel sermon that we have preached here in Acts chapter 3. But before we get to that part of this chapter, that gospel sermon, we have uh, an account here at the beginning of Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 9, that I want us to look at, that sets up that gospel sermon that is later preached by Peter. We read here in Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 1, now Peter and John went together to the temple at the, uh, at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have. But what I do have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankles and bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. It goes on from this point, and Peter uses this as an opportunity to preach and like we said, the second gospel sermon that we see preached. And no doubt we oftentimes use this account here. And, and we talk about, note the fact that a notable miracle was, uh, was done, was performed. And we also talk about what uh, truly is there with miracles that we see in the first century, uh, separate and apart from miracles uh, that, that, well, what people call miracles today, and, and these notable facts and all these types of things. But what I want to point out, what I want to look at is a statement that's made by Peter. Silver and gold I do not have. What we recognize is this lame man that was laid at the gate called Beautiful since, uh, you know, he, he, he was lame since birth and they would take him daily and lay him there. Every day he was laid at this gate. We see later in Acts chapter 4 that this was a 40-year-old man. So for 40 years he is one that does not have uh, the, the ability to walk, And he's laid at this gate, and what is he asking for? Well, he's, he's asking for alms. And that's what he's expecting to receive whenever Peter and John come walking in as well. He's expecting to receive mercy, pity, something in the form of charity. And we see by Peter's response to him the acknowledgement and the fact that we understand that he's looking for gold and silver, something of a temporal nature to help him get by. And this is something that was common in the first century. People who didn't have the ability to work as this man didn't. He was lame from birth. He laid at the gate, being put there, and asking for something to help him get by for the next day. But you know, that was what this man was looking for. Been looking for that every day. Been looking for silver and gold just to help him get through that day. Alms, help me get through this day and help me get to the next day. But what he received was something far greater than that. He received something, something in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and that being the ability to walk, something that he didn't expect, something that nobody else was expecting as well. And we see the joy that he has in his life as well and what it leads to in the preaching of the first gospel sermon. What I want us to do this morning is look at that statement, silver and gold I do, I do not have. Peter tells them, I don't have silver and gold. I don't have what you might be looking for in a temporal nature. I don't have what you might be looking for just to get you through the next day. What I have is something that's life-changing for you. I have something that's going to change your life, and that's what he gave them. He gave them the ability to walk. I want us to look at that this morning, and I want us to look at our lives, and I want you to keep this question before you this morning as we go through this lesson. What is it that you are looking for? 
What this man was looking for, silver and gold. He said, that's not what I have. What I do have is something that's life-changing and that's life-altering. What I want us to first start off with, though, is notice and recognize some truths about silver and gold because that's what so many today look for. That's what so many throughout time have looked for, silver and gold. To, to It might not be rich, although that is something we're definitely going to look at, but that which will help me be able to get through this next day. Just a little bit of silver, a little bit of gold. We're looking for something of a temporal nature, and I want us to notice some truths about silver and gold. It is just that. It's temporal. We see in Matthew 6, verse 19, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. Silver and gold is something that's of this earth, that's of this world, that's of a temporal nature that will be destroyed. That's what Peter says in 2 Peter 3, verse 10, But the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with the fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. The things in this earth will be burned up. What's in this earth? Silver and gold. It's temporal. It's not eternal. It's something that is only going to last for a certain period of time. Not only that, but silver and gold, things of this world, those aren't the things that satisfy. That's one of the points that, the Ecclesiast that uh, Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes. He says here in chapter 5, verse 10, He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he who loves abundance with increase. This also is vanity. This is something that Harry's talking about on Wednesday nights in his class in here in the auditorium, about Solomon and going after these different things of this life, trying to find satisfaction, trying to find joy in every path and road that he goes down. He continues to come up empty, and his ultimate conclusion is, Man's all is to fear God and to, keep, and to keep his commandments. One of those things that he passes, he goes down, is trying to be satisfied with silver. Trying to have that temporal life and the riches that are in it be something that's satisfactory to, to him. And he can't find it. And what we recognize about Solomon is he was the uh, richest, wealthiest, wisest king that there was. Anything that he wanted, he could have. God gave him that. Yet he didn't find satisfaction in that. And we notice and recognize that in our own life as well. We think if I just get X amount of dollars or if I get start getting paid this or if I get to this point in my life financially, then I'm there, then I'm going to be satisfied. I'm not going to have what I want. And that just simply isn't the case. We continue to want more and more and more. That's something Scripture lays down. That's something that we see in our life. Not only that, but we see that uh, silver and gold, that it's deceptive. We read here in uh, Proverbs 23, the book of wisdom, verses 4 through 5. Do not work, do not overwork to be rich, because of your own understanding cease. Will you set your eyes on that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings, they fly away like an eagle toward heaven. We recognize this here in the scripture, and we, we recognize as we compare it back with Ecclesiastes 5.10, the silver and gold isn't going to satisfy. But yet, what do we do so often? We think that it will. So what do we do? We overwork. And here in this country, we do have a, uh, um, you know, that mind to work in so many cases. So many, uh, especially in this area, are brought up with that mindset. Have a mind to work. You work hard, and you'll get paid, and no doubt, we read from Scripture, the word to be those who are hardworking. But a lot of times what happens is we get our eyes fixated on the wealth and the riches. We get our eyes fixated on the silver and gold, which is temporal, not satisfying. And we overwork to get it because, look, if I get to that point, then I'm going to be satisfied. So we overwork. We spend so much time and effort in going and getting so many different college degrees so maybe we can get paid X. Or putting in more times, asking for overtime at work. Or we do the reverse where we get so far into debt because we want these things of this life that it forces us to overwork and over to pay off that debt. So many different things, the path that we go down is so deceptive, we think we're going to be satisfied. We think that we're going to, to be there, yet what happens to it? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away like eagle toward heaven. We spend it faster than we can make it. That so often happens in our life, and we aren't satisfied. We're not satisfied, and we recognize the temporal nature of it. But not only that, we recognize that silver and gold, that riches, they bring about a false sense of security. 
In Psalm 49, we read in verses 6 through 12, those who trust in their wealth and boast in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their souls is costly, and it shall cease forever, that he should continue to live eternally and not see the pit. For he sees wise men die. Likewise, the fool and the senseless person perish and leave their wealth to others. Their inner thought is that their houses will last forever. Their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. Nevertheless, man, though in honor, does not remain. He's like the beast that perish. You got two different points that are pointed out here in the psalm. First of all, those who have silver and gold or those who are working to obtain it, they have this false sense of security to think, you know what, I'm so wealthy, I'm so successful, I can buy somebody. I can, I, I, I can buy somebody out of eternal condemnation. I can buy my brother. I can help them in that way financially. That's not the case. The cost of their souls is worth more than silver and gold. The cost of their souls is worth the blood of Jesus Christ, and that's what it came to be. And so there, there, there's this false sense of security that because I'm so wealthy, because I have silver and gold, that I'm good. That's not the case. It costs more than silver and gold. Not only that, but they think that this is something that can keep being passed down and last for generation to generation. And that's not the case either. What we need to understand is this. Silver and gold brings about a false sense of security. For this layman, it might have gotten him through the next day, but that's all it was going to do. What we need to understand and what we need to recognize is there's something greater than silver and gold. And that's what Peter and John tell this layman, what they ultimately give him. Not only that, but silver and gold is a very short-sighted approach. It's a very short-sighted view of things. We see with the rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10. The rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10, he's one who appears to be one who wants to know what he needs to do. I mean, he, he appears to be one who's, who's all in, who's, who's going to be willing to give up anything to go to heaven, to make sure he's right with the Lord. And he goes through these different things with Jesus, and Jesus ultimately understands something. He says in verse 21, Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. And Come, take up the cross and follow me. But what happened? Verse 22, But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful. Why? For he had great possessions. It's a very short-sighted approach or view of things. Jesus said, this is what you need to do, sell your silver and gold. Sell what you have. Sell that what you have. It's a temporal nature. Anyways, get rid of it, and you will have what you're looking for. This man couldn't. All he could see what was right in front of him, the silver and gold that he has, and he had those great possessions, and he was unwilling to let them go. And so the truth about silver and gold, and there's more that we can go through, are these different things. It's temporal, and it's not something that's going to satisfy it's deceptive, it brings about a false sense of security, and it's a very short-sighted view of things. So what do we then understand and what do we recognize? We recognize that this isn't what we need to be looking for. We don't need to be looking for these things, but yet man so often does. Yet what does Jesus say? What do we need to go after? Well, Peter and John said what they have is in the name of Jesus Christ. I want you to understand and recognize that while so often we look for those temporal earthly gains with silver and gold, that that's not what the gospel brings forth. That's not what the gospel is about. That's not why Jesus came. Jesus didn't come to make us rich here on this earth with silver and gold. That wasn't the purpose of his coming. That's not the purpose of his church. Why Jesus came was to seek and save the lost. That's what we read in Luke 19 verse 10. In Luke chapter 19, what we have is an account with uh, an individual or a man named Zacchaeus. Jesus is one who's uh, passing through Jericho. He's on his way, and there's crowds all around him, and Zacchaeus is one that's climbing up in the trees. He's, he's trying to get a glimpse of him. And Jesus, recognizing that, calls Zacchaeus down. And he comes down, and, and, and some of the, 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 the Jews and others are looking at him, and what, what, what do you have to do with this man? And Jesus tells them, that today salvation has come to this house because he is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That is the reason or purpose for his coming. 
The reason and purpose for his coming was to seek and to save that which was lost, not to bless people financially with silver and gold and all those types of things here on this earth. This is why Jesus came. And I want you to think about something. If the reason for Jesus' coming was to give people health and wealth, some of what we hear in various denominations, the health and wealth gospel and all those types of things, then why would he be messing around with a man named Zacchaeus, who in verse 2 we read was a tax collector and a rich man? If what he cared about was rich, what was being rich here on this earth was silver and gold and, and health and, and all those types of things, he wouldn't have been looking for a man like Zacchaeus, but he did, and he called him down. Why? Because it wasn't about being rich here on this earth. It's about being rich spiritually. It's about seeking and saving that which was lost, that which is lost. That's why Jesus came. And we recognize and we see that. And the reason why Jesus had to come and seek and save that which is lost is because what man did. We lay this out quite often, but we need to understand this. We need to recognize this. What man did, according to Isaiah 59, verse 2, is separated himself from God. Your iniquities have separated you from God. That's what we read there. And then we read in Romans 3, 23, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So man has separated himself by God, from God by sinning through his iniquities. And all have done this. This isn't just for a select group of people. All have sinned. Not only that, but we read what we are deserving of as a result in Romans 6, 23. All have sinned, and the wages of that sin is death. That's what we are deserving of. This is what man did, and this is the position that man has put himself in. Understand that. We have put ourselves in a position through our sins of separating ourselves, not being in a right relationship with God, being in darkness as we read in various passages throughout Scripture. Silver and gold is not going to be that which brings back man into that right relationship with God. Silver and gold isn't going to do that. You can't buy your way back into heaven. And Jesus and God, they can't give you enough silver and gold to be able to purchase a relationship back with God. But this was provided by Jesus. What does Jesus provide? What Jesus provides is not silver and gold. What Jesus provides is salvation. A little bit later... After, after uh, we read about that account with the lame man. Yeah, the lame man, that he was healed. A notable miracle was done. Then you have Peter preach the second gospel sermon that we have there in Acts chapter 3. And then we have the Jews and others, they recognize that a notable, that a notable miracle has been done. And they come and they ask. They're asking Peter, they're asking John, in whose name have you done this in? And he tells them. And he gets down into verse 10, 10 through 12. He says, Let it be known to all, or to you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Pay attention now, verse 12. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given. Among, by men, among men by which we must be saved. How are we saved? It's through the name of Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus Christ provides. He provides salvation. He provides that opportunity to be brought back into a right relationship with God. That idea of salvation, that idea of being saved, is you are in a helpless state. You can't do it in of yourself. And that's what we need to recognize and that's what we need to realize that we cannot in of ourselves save ourselves. We are like that lame man, that individual who's there and cannot do anything in of himself to bring back, to bring healing to himself, to fix the problem of being lame. We put ourselves in a state where we separated ourselves from God through our sins. And we cannot do anything in of ourselves to be brought back into a reconciled state. But Jesus provided that opportunity for us to do it. There's nothing that we did. This is something that Jesus did for us. We read in Romans 6.23. Earlier we looked at the fact that for the wages of sin is death. The fact that we separated ourselves from God. But, he says, that's what we've earned. That's where we are. That's the state that we're in. We are deserving of death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
We are deserving of death. We put ourselves in that situation. And if we're looking for silver and gold to be satisfied, we won't be because we cannot, through silver and gold, put ourselves back into a right state with God. But it's through Christ that we can, through that gift that we can. We read in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. Paul writing here says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That individual, Jesus Christ, one who knew no sin, it was a perfect man, did not sin while he was here on this earth. That's one that bore the sins on our behalf so that we have that opportunity to be made right with him. That's what Jesus provides. You know, so often we're looking for silver and gold to satisfy us, to make us feel complete, to make us feel whole, to make us feel safe. We think that there's security in it. The only security there is is security in Jesus because that is the only way that we can be brought back into a reconciled, right relationship with God. It's through the blood of Jesus. And that's what he provides us. He provides us something far greater than silver and gold ever can. Not only does he provide salvation, not only does he provide that healing and to be brought back into a reconciled and and, and proper state with God, but whenever we have been brought back into that reconciled state, we are now in a proper standing with God. We now have the proper relationship with God. There is peace that is provided as a result of that. We read in 2 Timothy 2, verse 22, that we are to pursue peace. Paul writing to Timothy says, Flee also youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace. Those who call on the Lord with a pure heart. This is something that we are to pursue. We're to pursue peace. And so many people look for it. They look for peace. And they look for it in so many different avenues and so many different areas in, in this life. In many of which think that peace comes from temporal successes they come from this satisfaction that i get it might be silver and gold it might be something else but that's not where peace comes from it doesn't come from silver and gold that's not what is going to bring about peace in this life that wasn't going to bring about peace for this lame man all that was going to do is make him allow him to get to the next day the peace that is to be pursued is that peace that only comes through jesus christ we read in romans chapter 5 In Romans chapter 5, in verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. How do we have peace with God? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how we have peace. We get on down to verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. That reconciliation is what's going to bring about this peace. That reconciliation with God brings about peace in this life because I now know that I am in a right relationship, a right standing with God. It's the idea that we have over in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 through 14. In verse 13, we read, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. Christ has become that peace. Why? Because through him, we have hope. Through him, we can be brought back into a right relationship with God. Prior to this, one of the things Paul is pointing out to the fact when he's writing to those in uh, Ephesus, those who would be Gentiles, is the fact that before Christ came, you had no hope. You were separated, you were alienated from God, you had no hope. As a result of that, you have no peace. But because Christ came, the Prince of Peace came into this world and died the death that he did, through him we now have that opportunity to have true peace. Like I said, a lot of times people search for peace through silver and gold or temporal means. 
those things perish and they don't bring about peace. And you might not have to look too far in this country to see that that's the case. One scripture tells us that's the case, but just look at Hollywood or look at those who are successful financially, those who might have wealth and fame and all those types of things. We see no peace in their life. They might try to put on a front, but it's pretty easy to tell that there is no peace involved in that. There's no peace involved in anything that's of a temporal nature. Where is peace involved? Peace is involved and peace comes and is provided by Jesus through his blood. Because through his blood, through that sacrifice, we can be made right with God and know that whenever Christ returns or whenever life here on this earth ends, that we are in a right state and prepared and ready for the judgment. Now, peace doesn't come from silver and gold. Peace comes through the name of Jesus Christ. But not only that, what Jesus provides is Jesus provides hope. Jesus provides hope in this life because of, of uh, being through his blood. We read in 1 Peter chapter 1. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten to us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It is through Jesus that we have that living hope. And living is in comparison, is contrary to a dead hope. Living and the dead are something that's polar opposites of one another. This is a living hope. This is a true hope. This is one that we can depend upon. This is one that isn't going to disappoint because it's through Jesus Christ. And we read over in Romans chapter 5, verses 5 through 8, why it's, be, why it's a hope that won't disappoint. That hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our heart or in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who's, who was given to us. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Hope will not disappoint because the love of God was demonstrated in the giving of, his, of Jesus, in the giving of his son. We were in a situation when we were separated from him, when we were alienated from him. We were in a situation when we are not in a right state with him. But yet God sent Jesus to die for us. We were the ones that put ourselves in that state. God didn't put us there. We were the ones that sinned. We were the ones that separated ourselves from God. God didn't do it. But what does God do? Through Jesus, he provides that means of reconciliation. He provides that means to be able to be brought back into a right relationship with him. And as a result of that, we can have hope. And we can trust in that hope. Because he gave his son for us. We read over in he Hebrews 6, 19, the fact that hope is an anchor. Jesus Christ being that hope that we have is that anchor for us. Because we have that hope through Jesus Christ, we can be anchored in this life. We can get through anything. You know, so many times we look for hope in, in, in other means, in other areas. We, we, we hope for different various things. Hope is this idea in the word translated. Hope means confident expectation. There's a confident expectation in Christ. You know, I can hope for the Kansas City Chiefs to win another Super Bowl, but I don't well with Patrick Mahomes and all. But I'm not sure if we will, right? We can hope for these things, but we, might, we don't have the confidence that we have here. The confidence that we have here is a confidence that is sure that is steadfast, and it is an anchor that regardless of what we're going through in this life, we can stand through it. That's what we see in 1 Peter 3, verse 15. In 1 Peter 3, 15, at least whenever I think I hope, this is a verse that my mind typically goes to, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We can give that defense. Why? Because there is a confident expectation that is in us. We know that God sent his only begotten son for us. And that we can be brought back into this right relationship and this right standing. We can be confident in that. If we live according to his word. Because we're made right with him, we can stand in anything. You go back to the beginning of this letter, and that's where we looked in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. That through Jesus is that living hope. 
You think about this letter as a whole and who he's writing to and what these people are going through. They're going through trials. They're going through persecution. They're going through things that are not pleasant, standing for truth. But yet he tells them you can have a hope. And he talks about it over and over and over again throughout that letter. You can have that hope. Why? Because you can be confident in the fact of the words of Jesus and the words of God. That through Jesus, you can have hope of eternal life. Through Jesus, you can be made right with him. You see, this is what Jesus provides us. Silver and gold are something that's temporal. It's something that doesn't satisfy It's something that gives a false sense of security. It's something that we go after in this life, and whenever we go after it, we always seem to end up coming short. We never have enough of it. We're never to a point where we can relax and breathe, where we can have true peace. We never really have hope. We we have this expectation because of the silver and gold that that, that we might be after, that once we get it, that things are going to be good, and it just never seems to work out that way. Why? Because it's deceptive. It's not what we need in order to have true peace and hope in this life. It's not going to bring about salvation. What does? Jesus Christ is the one that brings that about. And so I come back to the question that we started off with. What is it that you are looking for? What are you looking for in this life? Are you looking for that which is of a temporal nature? That which might get you through this life, but you're never truly satisfied? And at the end of the day, you're always looking for more. Jesus tells us in Matthew 6, 20, after he said to not lay up for ourselves treasures on this earth where moth and rust destroy, he tells us to lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. That's what we are to be looking for. That's where our mind is to be. You go back to that account of that layman. That wasn't what he was expecting. That wasn't what he was looking for. And whenever he received it, he recognized it came to the realization of what he had. In the name of Jesus, what are you looking for? What you can have is completely life-altering, life-changing news of the gospel that's going to completely transform your life. You're no longer going to be worried about the things of this life, of this world. Your focus is now going to be in heaven. And with that is going to come that true peace, that's going to come that true hope, that's going to allow you to stand in any situation. Why? Because you have obtained, you are in a state of being saved you are one who uh, has gone through the name of jesus christ in order to be saved we need to recognize those true riches and we need to pursue them as we see in hebrews 11 verse 6 in hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 we read but without faith it is impossible to please him for he who comes to god must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him We need to recognize this. We need to understand this. And it doesn't matter what age you are. You might be somebody that's later in life. And you've been after temporal uh, silver and gold riches and wealth of this life. And you continue to come up short. And you recognize that you can change that today. You might be somebody who's in going through a midlife crisis. You're middle age. And and, and you realize and recognize that those things that you've been working hard for. and, And trust me, I've been there. I went to school, I don't know, changed my degree, I don't know how many times, trying to do different things, searching for happiness and peace and all those types of things, working hard, putting in hours, thinking that that was going to satisfy me, that I was going to be pleasing to to men and and those that I look up to. And at the end of the day, I kept coming up empty. Silver and gold isn't going to satisfy. What you need to do is you need to seek, not that which is on this earth, as we read in Colossians, but that which is above. That's what we are to be after. That's what we're to seek. Because we have an understanding and a belief and a trust that God is going to reward those who diligently seek him. What are you looking for? Are you looking for something here on this earth and you keep on coming up empty? You you think things are going good and then something like COVID-19 hits and it ruins everything that you had going, your plans. It doesn't matter what gets thrown your way. In Jesus Christ, there is always opportunity of salvation and to, be, and to have hope and to have peace in this life and that's what we are to be after what are you looking for we need to understand is the difference between a temporal and an eternal it, between temporal and eternal riches that which we are after so often is of a temporal mindset and those things never satisfy you think of one who's won the lottery 
And you think, man, they're set for life. But yet, how quickly does that money go away? And it only lasts a little while that they're satisfied. You think of athletes or movie stars that have made so much money in their life, and the same things happen to them. They've blown all their money, and they never found satisfaction. All they found was continued headache and problems, continuing to dig themselves into sin. That which is eternal, that Jesus provides is a long-lasting, life-altering choice that you can make. A relationship and union with God that cannot be bought and it cannot be earned. It's given to you. Are you willing to go after that? Are you willing to seek him and to seek that reward? Well, if you are, then you need to understand something. You need to understand that in order to receive these riches, you must be obedient to the gospel. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 through 9, we read, And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you want hope? you want peace? you want salvation? then you've got to be one who obeys the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you don't obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're one who is still separated from him. So then the question becomes, well, what is the gospel? The gospel message. We read in Mark chapter, that should say 16. I'm sorry for the typo there. Mark chapter 16, verses 15 through 16. Jesus tells us here, in the Great Commission, he said, and he says, Go into all the world and preach and teach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 16, Jesus is telling us the path to salvation, to have that peace and that hope. We're to go out and that message is to be taught, is to preach and teach the gospel to all the world, and it's the same message. He who believes and is baptized is saved. You've got to be obedient to that gospel message. And that's exactly what we see carried out. We see in Acts chapter 9 and verse 6, whenever Paul is on there in that account, he's still Saul, but whenever he's on the road to Damascus and he's persecuting Christians left and right, Jesus appears before him. And Jesus appears before him and asks him what he's doing and Paul uh, is in a conversation with him and he realizes that what he is doing is wrong. And what does Paul ask? He asks, what do you want me to do? There's Jesus right before him. Paul said, what do you want me to do? Well, if nothing needed to be done, then that's what Jesus would have answered. Jesus would have said nothing. All you need to do is just say that I'm, I'm Lord and we're all good. We're all square and straight. That's not what Jesus tells him. Jesus' response tells him to go, arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. We see he does arise and he does go into the city. And what happens? Well, whenever he's recounting that story in Acts chapter 22, verse 16, Paul says that Ananias told him to arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. What needs to be done? Exactly what Jesus told us needs to be done in the Great Commission. To be baptized, to believe and to be baptized for the remission of sins. We see something similar with the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch is, is reading from Scripture. Philip goes up to him. Whenever Philip goes up to him, he asks him if he knows what he's reading. His response is, how can I unless somebody teaches me? And so from there, we read that Philip then preaches Jesus to him. As I go a little bit further, the eunuch comes uh, by some water, and he says, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Philip's response, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And then we see that the Ethiopian eunuch, Philip, went down in the water and that he was baptized. If you want to have that hope, if you want to have that peace, if you want to be one who is in a right, reconciled state with the Lord, you need to be one who's obedient to that gospel message. It is there. Jesus is providing something for you far greater than this earthly success and wealth can ever do. And I'm not sitting here trying to say, nor will I ever say, that a wealthy person is one who is not right. That's not the point of this lesson. The individual who's looking for silver and gold, that that's what they're after in this life. They're never going to find what they're looking for. People are always looking for peace. They're looking for, for true hope in this life. Well, I want to tell you, the one who has true hope is the one who is in Christ. That's what we read in Ephesians 2, 11 through 14. 
When we looked at that account, we saw that without Christ, there is no hope. But Paul writes, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. What? Now you who are in Jesus Christ. So those who are in Christ are the ones who have hope. We read in Galatians 3.27 that we are baptized into Christ. That's how we get into Christ. Are you one who has been obedient to that gospel? And I ask once again, what is it that you're looking for? Are you looking for something that's just going to get you through another day, another year, another month? Are you looking for something that's going to get you through just a, a, the, this life only? Or are you looking for something that's for eternity, that's eternal? That's what we have in Jesus Christ. The question is, have you been obedient to that gospel message that allows you to be prepared for that day? If you have not, the waters of baptism are here and there are ready for you this morning. You can come forward believing that Jesus is the Son of God, as we saw in Mark 16, 15, and 16, and being baptized for the remission of sins, as we see in Acts 2, 38, and the other examples that we threw up there. Whenever you do it, you will have that true hope. If you have done that, but you have fallen away, you have gone back into the ways of the world, we can help you with that as well. We can pray for you. We can pray with you. If you have any need, we ask you to come and stand while we sing the song.